So last week we talked about, we, we kicked off this story talking about the son who had went to his father and said, listen, you're dead to me. I want my inheritance. And he, so he goes into a distant land. He went to a, to a Gentile land. He begins to squander his, squander his inheritance. Everything that his father had provided for him, whenever he died, he went to his dad and he said, I wanna cash in on it now. And he, so he goes to this distant land and the Bible says that he wasted his inheritance on wild living. And so a famine hits the land, all of his money's gone. He's working for a pig herder. He's, he's not just a slave to the pig herder, he's actually enslaved to the pigs. He's serving them and he's dying of starvation. And the Bible says that whenever he finally comes to his senses, that he decides that he might try and go back home. And this is where we're picking up today, Luke 15, verse 17. It says, when he had finally come to his senses, he said to himself, at home. At home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father. Come on, don't you love that? He's not just going home. He's going back to dad. I'll go back to my father. And say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Other words, I don't have to have a title. You can, you can disown me. You can just put me out back with it where all the servants live. Just take me on as a hired servant just so I'm not hungry anymore, so I can eat. And it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful story. And so it says in verse 20, and this is gonna be our text today. Verse 20 says, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, the father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the story continues, and we're going to be getting into that as we go in this series. But what the son said is, I'll go home. Maybe my father will be merciful to me. Now, he knew his father was good enough to be merciful to him. He knew his father would be, would be kind enough to kind of live out back or, you know, have some little place on the land. He knew his father would be merciful in that. But he did not realize how gracious his father was going to be. So he went seeking mercy and he found grace. And this is what we have when we come to Jesus. We go seeking forgiveness. We go seeking acceptance for God. And God goes, I got so much more than acceptance for you. I've got reinstatement to sonship. I've got a new identity for you. And so when we... We, we look at this story, the father has five actions that he demonstrates to the son. Now, you might not know this, but five is the number of grace. Five is, isn't it interesting that, that Jesus is a, a five letter word? Isn't it interesting that grace itself is a five letter word? Come on. Five is the number of grace. And so what we see is the father has these these five different actions that we see. And that's what I want to explore this morning. First of all, the father sees. We, we, We talked about this a little bit last week. The only way that the father could see if the son was coming is because the father was looking for him. And most of us are troubled when we say God sees everything. Most of the time when we talk about God seeing everything, we think of it as like, man, I better be careful, right? I never better, better keep my nose clean, better be squeaky clean because God sees you. And, and many religious have come to us and said, God knows. And he does, and God does know. But God in his knowing is not angry. I, I want you to understand this, that God isn't just looking to, to, to punish you for the wickedness that you're living in. While he was still a way off, a long way off. And he was, he was a lot further in proximity of his heart than he was in, dis, in, in literal distance. But the father saw him coming. I, I want you to understand that God knows all. God sees all. 
He sees you. He is aware. The good, the bad, and the ugly, God sees it. All of it. He also sees the little obedience that you have. And sometimes we think, man, I, you know, it's just a little thing. It's not that big of a deal. It's a little five-minute prayer. It's a little, hey, I'm going to listen to worship on the way to work today. God sees that. Yeah. God also sees the, the compromise. God also sees the bitterness. He sees the things that you're carrying. He, he sees the secrets. You can't keep any secrets from God. Good secrets or bad secrets, you can't keep any secrets from God. It says this in Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. Yes. Keeping watch on the wicked and the good. So he sees all of it. He's aware of your secret sins. He knows what you were scrolling and looking at yesterday. He knows the attitude that you had when you thought nobody else would see the attitude that you had at that person at Walmart. He's, he sees it all. And most of us are troubled by that. I, I, sometimes I get, I'm like, oh, God saw that. You ever, get, you ever do that? You're like, oh. And the Lord's like, yeah, I, I saw that. I know you think that nobody else saw it, but I, but I did, I saw it. But I want you to understand this, that even in your frail weakness, he does not despise you. Yeah. Job has this beautiful verse that says, God is mighty. He is powerful. He's strong. But he does not despise men. He is mighty and firm in his purpose. He is mighty. He is strong. But he doesn't look at you and go, you're just such a frail, broken prodigal. You're just a miserable sinner. And many have painted and they had this image of God that God sees them. And he's like, he's like put out with you. He's just so done. And, and, and I've approached God like this early in, in my walk, like things that I was struggling with. I, I remember going to the Lord and be like, Lord, Lord, here I am again. I can't, I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed, Lord. Like, isn't it funny how we get before the Lord with shame? I'm like, I'm kind of embarrassed that I did this again. I'm kind of embarrassed that I lusted again, Right. And God's like, I see it, but I don't despise you. In fact, I provided a way for you to get out of that. And I also want to tell you today that he sees your weakness. He sees your small yes. He, he sees your intention when you're intending, when you start out well and you don't finish well. He, he sees that. But he doesn't despise you just because you finish poorly. He still pursues you. He's still gracious towards you, even when you blow it. And what I love is we have this, this picture of the garden, the garden of Eden. And Adam sins. God knew Adam sinned. And God goes to Adam and he's like, Adam, where are you? Like God needed him to answer that question. And he's like, well, Lord, I, I, I sinned and, and I'm naked. And he's like, who told you you're naked? Uh well, the woman, he just starts making excuses. Well, my wife, you know, this woman you gave me, right? And he begins to blame shift. But, but the point that I'm making today is that God still showed up in the garden. He didn't just create this beautiful earth and put Adam in it and go, man, it's, it's yours. Go ahead and stir it really well. He puts him there. Adam blows it. And God's, God's not like... I'm done with him. I'm out. No, God still showed up. Even though he sees your mistakes, he still shows up. Even though he sees how frail you are and how weak you are and how undisciplined you are, the grace of God goes, I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere. I see you. I see you. And I still want you. You may feel worthless. You may feel unvaluable, but I see you. He does not despise you. So this is the first thing that we see about the father is that he sees. The second thing that we see about the father is that he cares. It says this, that he was filled with love and compassion. So God has this moment when he sees the son. 
I portrayed it this, this way last week, that God is looking, the Father is looking in the distance and he sees this figure in the distance, this scrawny and dirty and frail and just a fraction of his former self. And he looks at him and it says this, he sees him and that he's filled with love and compassion. He's not like, oh, I knew it'd come to this. I hope you learn from your mistakes. No, he's filled. That word filled means, means filled, right? It means overflowing. But listen, God has a lot of fullness. Yeah. I mean, you can be filled with love and compassion, and that's a lot of fullness. You have a big heart, right? You, your heart gets stirred. You're like, oh, but God's heart is really big. Yeah. Yeah. And God, God has a depth that is, that is unfillable. It's like, it's like the, we talk about the, the ocean and how the ocean is full. It's full of water. Like it has a, it has a depth that we, we can't measure. How many gallons? I mean, maybe you'll Google it. How many gallons? I I don't know. It's like for us, for our mind, it's like beyond measure. How much more fullness does God have? The one who breathed it in and God is filled with love and compassion. According to your state, he looks at you and his heart is so full. The one who has no limit to his fullness and is full of love and compassion. He's not full of frustration and anger. He's full of love and compassion and tenderness towards you. He wants you. Now he hates the sin. He hates the condition, but he wants you. And understand that with with God's love, I, I feel like sometimes we make statements like, well, God is love. You know, God has this like cosmic obligation to love everyone because God is love, right? I mean, and, and yes, love is, is, is his nature, but, but it's not, understand, it is not an automated response. You ever like go to those chat things on, you know, a website you, you, or you call and you get a support. They're like, say your answer and they never, it never understands you. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like the struggle's real. Like you, you tag, you, you, you get on there. I do it on my computer most of the time. I'm like, there's a little chat bot there and I like get on there and I'm like, I need help with my, you know, try to be as clear as I can. I need help with, and then it pulls up this automated response. It's like, we're here to help. You are not here at all. There is a, there is an automated response to, to point me to an FAQ page on your website. This is not helpful. This is why I'm texting you, right? And then like three days later, you might get a generated email and we're just, we're looking for someone to talk to. And sometimes we feel like God is that automated response. Like we ask God a question or we say, God, I, I, you know, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Okay, great. But it does nothing for us because we feel like, well, God has to do that. It's because of who he is. And although there is a truth to that, the Lord, listen, is filled with compassion. Compassion, it's not just love. It's not just the, 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 the status of consistent, unyielding uh, love that is, that is a constant. No, 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 there's a compassion. When Jesus was moved with compassion, there was, a, there was something from it, that, that word in the Greek comes from his belly. Yeah. It's like, it is a felt affection that the Lord has for you. Understand this, that, that the Lord is, is, is really, like, really in love with you, right? We, we've had the conversation, well, I, I love you. I'm just not in love with you. Yeah. Well, well God, is, God loves you, and he is in love with you. Yeah. His, his heart is towards you. So, so it's, it's not an automated response from the Lord. Psalm 145, 8 says, The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, slow to get angry, right? We kind of treat God like he's this, he's got this like temper. <laughs> Better not mess with God, right? And we've said that, and you should, you should have a holy fear of the Lord. But, but God is, 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 the anger is like, it's a minute. He's like, eh, yeah, I don't like that. But I'm so in love with you. I'm so driven towards delight and desire for you that it's like, it's, 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 it's so much a wash over the anger and the tension. And what he's wanting is he's wanting to bridge the distance that the tension provides. So the father sees, the father cares. Number three, the father runs. 
runs. He runs. He's not, he's not like, well, you know, we kind of should go, we're waiting on the Lord. He's just kind of like, well, kind of old man God, you know. It's kind of the way we treat God, like he's this old, slow man that doesn't, doesn't want, listen, he's, he's faster than, he's instant. Everything with the Lord is, is now. Sometimes our timing has to line up with that. We talk about God's timing. Well, God's timing. God, usually it's our timing. You know, understand that he's a, he's a master planner. So he's working on all, all the hearts simultaneously, all the people in the room, and he's working it together to make it happen. I'm, I'm thinking about when we got this building, we prayed for like years, Lord, give us a building, give us a building. We want an old building with the, with the, you know, with a warehouse space. I mean, we prayed that for you in downtown, downtown ends at the next corner. And so we prayed all the other, Lord, we want it, Lord, you give it. We were praying over another building. Why are we getting this one, Lord? I mean, it was miserable. We were so miserable. But, but, at, but at a point in time when we had enough money in the bank and somebody else wasn't using the building, it was available. Right, right. And we're like, we were frustrated, but God was like, you just, you're just going to have to wait for because it's not just you, it's also them. And I've got to work all these things and work all these things. And it's just going to take time and you're just going to have to be patient. Oh, huh. Lord, please don't say that. It's like, no, don't tell me that, Lord. You ever get in that place? You're just like, Lord, nah. Patience. I ain't got got time for patience. So the son is reluctant in his return. The father was relentless as he ran out to meet him. And I love that he just, he casts off all restraint to go towards his son. Now there's a, there's a, a, a history lesson in Jewish culture that we can learn that for everyone, it wasn't just women to keep themselves modest and look at this way. It was actually men had to wear robes that did not show any skin. We had a swimming thing for the men's group last night. That's, you know, that's why I didn't swim because I, I wanted, I didn't want everybody to be like, hey, look how good Josh looks in a swimsuit. No, it was, really it's more the other thing. Uh, but in those days, first of all, an older man, an older man that is estately, right, that has an estate, it's obvious that he has a lot of money. He has hired servants. He's able to hire these people to work for him. So the father is, is kind of a dignified person in the story. And so for a, a person in Jewish culture to run, they would have to hike up their robe, <laughs> right, expose a little leg, hey, and take off running. Well, it, it, all that already. And then he's an older, dignified man who's probably highly respected in the community they're a part of. Joseph had a conversation with me last week after in the summer bash. He's like, have you heard about this thing that they do with the breaking of pots? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, the parable of the, of the prodigal. He's like, these people break pots. I'm like, dude, I don't, I don't know. I've been preaching for 30 years. I've never heard this. And so I got home and I Googled it, of course. And so what I found out is there's actually a ceremony called a kazaza ceremony. And what would happen is if someone was left a community and they said, we're going, we're leaving this community. What would happen, especially if they did something that was shameful, which the son was doing, if they came back to the community, they came back through through the town that they were a part of, the elders of the city would take clay pots and bust them before their feet. It was was a demonstration of saying, we are breaking fellowship with you. You are cut off from this community. You are not permitted to be here because of what you did. So it was a very shameful act for for the son. So I, I, we, don't, we don't know necessarily that this happened, but we can read that into Jewish culture to say possibly they were having this kind of ceremony, this ritual where they're saying, you're not welcome here. You went out and you sinned with, with prostitutes and you went and squandered what your father gave you. What you did is, is, is 
despicable and you're not welcome here. And they break these pots and saying you're publicly shamed and you're cut off from our community. That's what kazaza means. It means cut off from the community. And so they would do this. And so what we find, if you'll study this out in Jewish history, what we find is that the father would never go to these ceremonies because men were very stoic and unemotional. Like today. And so here he is coming through town to go back home and they're there ready to throw pots. Now the mom could go and she could plead for mercy and she might or might not have been there. But the father, they never went. But the father sees and the father cares and he's filled with compassion and the father takes upon something that is shameful and sees his son and says, I'm going to beat them before they can crush those pots, before they can exile my son. I'm going to beat them and I'm going to show them that he is accepted in my house. And he runs with compassion to his son and takes on a shameful act to remove a shameful act. And this is exactly what Jesus does on the cross. Anytime you see nakedness in scripture, it's always associated with shame. Adam's shame in the garden. And here the father exposing a little bit of himself to say, I don't care what anybody thinks. I don't, I, I don't care about dignity. The father chose desire over dignity. And this is what he did when he sent Jesus to be a suffering servant. This is why Jesus was so rejected and still today because he might not be necessarily the king that we would prefer. And to be born in a humble way, to be crucified as a criminal, to take on the shame of humanity. Jesus took all the shame Jesus was broken, not so that you could be exiled, but so you could be brought in to the family. So the father runs. And number four, the fourth act, the father embraces. So the father breaks in, he's through the crowd. He's here with his son and he embraces him. Understand the son is stinky. He smells like pig dung. He's probably scrawny and filthy. He probably has dirt and mud and poop on his face. Yet the father grabs him and embraces him. I, I want to tell you today that you don't have to get cleaned up to come to God. Right. You don't have to get sober. Yeah. You don't have to go and deal with all the drama that you've had in your family. Yeah. You don't have to get a handle on your addiction before you come to the Father. You come just like you are, yeah. stinky and mangled. Yeah. And the Father who sees and knows and gets all of it embraces you yes. and pulls you in. But God demonstrated, Romans 5 eight, his love for us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Out of his mercy, it's not because you were good. It's not because you had it all together, because you didn't and you still don't. I've been trying to get it together for 30 years. I, I'm still working on it. And guess what he does? He embraces me. He embraces me. He doesn't push me away. No, go back where you came from. You're not welcome here. He embraces you. I, I, I've talking, talked to many people over the decades of, of just like, I'm just not ready. I'm just not ready. I'm just not ready to come to God. I'm just not, just not ready to do all that. And there, 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 there can be some value to say, I don't wanna play games with God and I, and I get that. And I played that game for two years. I, I, I get that. But I'm telling you, you don't have to wait another day. 
You don't have to wait another day because the Father is here. He is here and he's ready to embrace you. And he's ready to set you free from that addiction. And he's ready to set you free from that shame. And he's ready to set you free from that stench. And that dysfunction that you've been operating in. He's ready to set you free from that. And he does it by pulling you in. And number five is the father lavishes love. Or you might put the word in there, affection. Man, God is affectionate. We've talked about how God is emotional and he's, he's, he's obviously emotional through this, through the scriptures. Some of us don't like that, especially men. We're like, oh, God's not emotional. He's kind of stoic. You got God wrong. God is high. Where do you think, where do you think human emotions came from? They came from God. We're not, we're not meant to be, we're, we're not meant to, to live according to what we're feeling, but emotions are the, the seasoning of life. God is highly emotional. But listen, God is also highly affectionate. See, he loves it. I know we love, we're like, oh, I just love worship. Worship is so good today. Get the chilies, you know. It's like, well, he just ministered to me. And it's like, you're just like, we love that. But guess who else loves that? God. He loves to do that to you. He loves to stir your heart. He's all about that. He wants to do a deeper work than that. Come on. But, he, but he, he likes it. He likes it when you're passionate during worship. You know why? Because he's passionate during worship. He's like, come on, let's go. We think, where's the man? That person's like, whoa, 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 really getting after it. It's like, dude, so is God. The Bible says that God actually rejoices. That, that, that word in the Hebrew language, it says that God spins around in circles with great excitement. Whenever he sees, whenever we glance at him, he's like, come on, let's go. Like he is, he is ready and exhilarated to express affection on you. And so when the sun shows up, it says that he embraces him and he kisses him. His poop stained face, the father kisses him right on the face. And the, 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 the King James version says that he falls on his neck. He's just giving him, you know, I, I do this with, with Uriah at night. I, I get in there and I start giving him sloppy wet kisses all over his neck and he's squeaming and squirming and all that. And I love every minute of it and he loves every minute of it. I, I like it that he's young enough that I can do that because he won't always love that. Yeah. I'll do it my 17 year old boy too. <laughs> I do it after service. <laughs> Listen, God is affectionate. One of the ways that He's affectionate is that, is that God reveals things to us. He shows us things. He, man, God is. We we. What I love about this story so much is it reveals who the Father is. It's not just who the Son is. It shows us the nature of the Father. Jeremiah 31 3 says, The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with my loving kindness. Who wants to be close to a God that's mostly angry? I'm not saying that God doesn't get angry, but who wants who wants to who wants to be close to a God that is mostly angry? And this is why most people live at a distance. This is why most people stay at the pigsty, because they think if I go home, he's gonna be mad. And he went seeking mercy. And he realized even someone who lived in the house with his dad before, he underestimated. He underestimated how affectionate he was. I love it. That word everlasting in the Hebrew is this, is perpetual love. It means it goes on and 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 on. God, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Don't you ever get tired of the love of God? No. He just loves me. He loves me. Listen, if that's all you ever hear from the rest of your life from your heavenly father, I love you, 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 I love you. That's that's a good enough word. That's a good enough word to set you free. That's a good enough word for you to see your value and rise up and live in holiness. That's a good enough word. It's good enough. How great is the love of the father? that he has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. 
And this is what we are. A father who sees our mess and goes, I hate that you're in this mess. I want to get you out of it. Come on home. Let me pull you close. Let me lavish on you these five acts that we see the nature of the father, his pursuit. He sees, he cares, he runs, he embraces, and he lavishes love. He's affectionate with you. God is affectionate. So go ahead and get a little wild in your pursuit of Jesus. Go ahead and respond to him in ways that other people might think you're kooky and flaky. Who cares? Well, somebody might think, I'm, you're, last I checked, you weren't doing it for people. Listen, I, I can tell you right now, going through the, the most difficult season of my life, dancing for my breakthrough in my living room with, with blasting hard rock worship music on my speakers, dancing relentlessly, unyielding before the Lord for like hours at a time just enjoying the love of God that took me through the most difficult season I've ever been through. This is like 22, 23 years ago. And it was just a response to the affections and the desires of God. Listen, loving on Jesus will take you through anything. <laughs> so what do I do? How do I get through it? Just, just, just love Jesus, just love on him. And this is what we get in Jesus. When Jesus comes and he shows up, the road, the way of the Father. Jesus is the radiance. He's the exact representation. Hebrew says this, that Jesus is, what, is, what does God the Father look like? He looks like Jesus. Hebrews 1 says, man, in past times, God spoke to the prophets. He, he spoke through all these people. But in these days, he speaks to us through his son. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact, the exact representation of the Father. John chapter one, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through the man, Jesus. What does the Father look like? He looks like Jesus. Thank you for joining us at Overflow Church today. We hope that you are encouraged and encountered the reality of Jesus. If you did, please let us know in the comments and make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss anything that we have coming up. Have a great day.